I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. <laughs> This is Auteur Detour, wherein three film lovers travel through the filmographies of cinema's most important directors in hopes of finding a greater understanding on the other side. Welcome to Auteur Detour. <laughs> the English voices. I'm just going to do an only English accent this whole episode. <laughs> No, I'm, the voice you did um, for this theme song. Yeah, I love that voice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome back to Autor Detour. Uh, I'm Ian Hinckley, here with Chris Balaza. Hello, film friends. <laughs> and Travis White. Hi. <laughs> hi. Hello. Bip, bip, and all that. I'm um, sorry. Okay, this sucks. Uh, oh, I'm going to do... We're, we're getting on to the next in our series of Alfonso Cuaron movies, which is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, there's not really any way to intro this movie because it's the third in a franchise of movies that if you don't know the story of Harry Potter, well, you probably shouldn't be seeking out random podcasts and just catch up on culture a little bit because it's dominated a lot of the last 20 years but anyway it's harry potter and this is the third movie i guess i can only say that like this is the one where harry potter uh comes into his own a little bit as a grown-up or as an older kid i don't know can we just get into it i love this movie travis do you like this movie i do like it it's been a little while since i kind of revisited these movies but uh my wife and i like met in college and like both like loved like uh fantasy books and stuff like that so it was like the height of harry potter mania so you know we did the cosplay we got the tattoos <laughs> no but we did uh we did read the books and uh we did really enjoy the movies and um alfonso Cuarón was already one of my favorite filmmakers when this came out yeah i was pretty stoked for it i feel like none of the movies i'm i'm like the i always love to be contrarian and say like the movie is always better than the book. But uh, I have to say, like, all the movies feel a little overly slavish to the books. And because of that, they never really feel, like, fully successful to me. Um, they never are, like, op operating on the level of, like, The Lord of the Rings or something like that. There's a ton of beautiful moments in this movie, and I'm really glad it exists. Uh, but revisiting it this time, I was like, you know, depending on my mood, I could, like, get really into it or just kind of, like, be like, yeah, that's okay. Up. that's yeah. my that's I my think feeling one of one of the things that i was feeling like most of all was just this is entering the time of like peak franchise filmmaking i guess we're we're, we're not i was gonna say i think but <laughs> the beginning but the, the beginning, beginning of, of that you know, yeah. that's what i meant like entering into it yeah and uh and it really feels like it's such a franchise movie like i mean all of these movies that were coming out at this time are so slavish to their source material in a way that like was never the case in Quaron's filmography before when he had based stuff on. Anyway, Chris, what do you think about this movie? <laughs> I'll start off by saying when we agreed to start a podcast together, I never would have imagined that we'd actually be covering a <laughs> Harry Potter movie. So this is pretty pretty <laughs> hilarious. But here we are. Uh, yeah, you know, I, this is the second time I ever saw it. The first time I think might have even been in the theater so it's fun to revisit this is one of those movies that i really loved when i first saw it. i'm like whoa there's just so much going on in this one there's a lot of little plot twists and things like that uh there's so much packed into this movie but this time around i, I admit i liked it a good bit less i also revisited or actually completed the whole harry potter oct Trilogy? I don't know what the word is for eight movies. But, <laughs> uh, trilogy. Uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I still really love this movie. You know, Quaron is awesome, um, but it doesn't feel as Quaroni, obviously. And even when I saw it the first time, I didn't even know. Uh, I knew who Quaron was, I suppose, just as a name, but I didn't look into what that meant for the movie or the style. I just felt like, honestly, another uh, Harry Potter movie when I first watched it. Um, I was really looking more for Quaronisms in this one this time around. And uh, we'll talk more about it, but it was certainly down played i like the movie um it's not one of my you know obviously favorites of his but it's probably st still my favorite harry potter movie i'd say as far as like the yeah. the bulk of the action it's got a lot of stuff going on that i really love yeah i think it's uh you know i was thinking about when this started i guess auteurs or you know just filmmakers that have like a specific style started coming into franchises and having their sort of 
uh, take on it? I don't know. I was trying to, I mean, do you guys have any insights into, okay, Travis, let me hear your thoughts on that. Uh, Warner Brothers has like a history. This has changed like in recent years, but has a history of handing over big money projects to directors with really interesting and unique kind of visions. Uh, I think the first one, uh, if I may venture a guess, that kind of fits this paradigm is 1989's Batman, directed by Tim Burton. Mm. But you can see oh, sure, it, yeah. but you can see it again and again with movies like Where the Wild Things Are by Spike Jones. Mm. Uh, not a franchise, but like, why would you give that property to <laughs> Spike Jones? Uh, and again, right. and, and, and this is not this is not Spike Jones directing like a Marvel movie. This is Spike Jones directing a Spike yeah. Jones movie that is also yeah. a big totally. uh, property. And I would say another great example is. Uh, Speed Racer, which is a Warner Brothers movie. Ah. Speed Racer, so, which uh, Quaron was briefly attached to direct, you know. I did not know. <laughs> That's bizarre. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, he, he was going to make it, and uh, he had Johnny Depp as, I think, the Racer X character. Dude, no. I, love that, um, I love that so much. But, uh, I know, but which I, would have been incredible. But I love the Wachowskis Speed Racer yeah. so much anyway, so yeah. I don't want to... You know, fantasize about what no, 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 no. I don't want Quaron. Direct- Quaron is such a like weirdo in, in the way he picks his projects. It, like, and I guess that's kind of what I want to talk about too. Like, this one didn't was like maybe the first one that didn't feel as much like a Quaron movie. It felt like a pretty version of a. It was more like Quaron doing like a Marvel movie or something where he kind of mm-hmm. uh, sublimates his own kind of directorial vision to like a franchise movie. What do you guys think of that? No I green. mean, I definitely agree. But I also think that, like, well, it's interesting you say no green because there is very there is little green. green in this movie. There is there green. There is, but, like, I was shocked that the Slytherin, just because of Cordon, like, there should have been some amazing Slytherin common room scene or something like that, you know? That's true. Because, like, yeah. like, why didn't he do something with that? Because well, he's so interested in green and, like, that's such a rich flavor of green because he's slytherin thing like i really think he's done green so much and i really yeah. and and there's a point where the movie um well early on this is okay so he did this movie i knew him primarily from at this point uh little princess and i was like so mm-hmm. excited that he was directing a kids movie and like a fantasy world movie and i was like oh yeah this is totally like his wheelhouse and but then he was coming off of e2 mama tambien which is such a different movie for him and then right. in the first in that first opening scene um, like the pre-credit sequence, Harry is like doing the wand thing in bed, like yeah. playing with his wand in bed. And it's like a little dumb, like kind of like a dumb joke. Uh, but he's doing this like illumination spell so he can like read a book under the bed because he has no like nightlight or flashlight or whatever. And it's this pulsating white light that then kind of fades into like a silky black. And I feel like he's basically creating like, or like showing you like the main visual motif that you're going to like experience throughout the movie. This like kind of like bright white coming up and then like this silky black, like covering up this thing. And so that you see that like play out again and again, uh, visually throughout the movie, but kind of near the end of the movie, like the climax, the movie, like it becomes nighttime and the movie almost turns into like a black and white movie. Uh, oh, yeah. And then the one exception is the bright green of greenery of like the grass and the forest where they are. So sure. like, okay. right. I think there is green, yeah. but it's just used. It. Uh, it's just um, it's not. He's not doing it the same way. I want to say he's evolving because this is very much in line with something that I was thinking about about that intro to the movie, mm-hmm. and just that first section before he goes back to Hogwarts is the most Quaron feeling like directorial di- directorially you know in the movie like it's got the weird camera movements that he's so you know sort of famous for of like the the moving camera and um that scene with aunt marge you know that sort of opening scene is so different than anything that happens in the first two and really anything that happens later in terms of tone and it kind of made me realize that like i think he did that on purpose that like once he got to Hogwarts, he's like, okay, I'm giving in to, like, the the franchise. You know, he's like, I am just not going to overbear myself with this, you know, and just let the franchise be itself. Right. But, like, he did give himself those moments in that scene, especially, where it's like, this is a bizarre fucking thing. And then I was also going to say about the color palette, like, thing is, there is a very specific color palette in this movie. And, like you mentioned, it's very black and white feeling. Like, not just in that last section but really just 
it's so dark. And, you know, the other movies in this are not. Like, it's a very colorful franchise in general. I mean, especially the first two. The first two, yeah. Um, They're much more. So warmer. for this to be coming, you know, I mean, I think the other ones were kind of reacting to this being made, all obviously, later. The way that they toned it down, but... Anyway, and I also thought it was interesting, like, a lot of the characters have their own sort of color palettes, too. I don't know if that's uh, something that's, um, it's just something that I maybe was guessing at, kind of, because I was picking that kind of thing apart. But, like, the, the, the colors that they all wear in all of their different outfits are very, like, specific, you know? And I yeah, think he did that they are. on purpose. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, to that point, I was just thinking that because again, I'm watching this movie looking specifically for more Quaronisms, and yeah, actually, uh, you nailed it because I wrote down, and this is the early part of the movie as he is talking with Mister Weasley, and Mister Weasley basically describes that Sirius Black is his godfather and a couple other things. It's the only long take in the movie that's over like a matter of a few seconds. It's yeah. about two minutes long, and I'm like, yeah, here we go. And then, of course, shortly after that, we go to Hogwarts, and uh, it becomes again. I, I couldn't really have, I wouldn't necessarily have known it would be Quaron mm-hmm. much after that point. I think you know, I'm looking for like the camera movements and all this stuff, and yeah, only long take was right there. He got that in, and that was about it, you know, at least that I recall. Yeah, well, it seems Travis? like he, I feel like he was kind of, you know, Ian, I think you were saying this, but like the scene where the ant arrives is shot handheld, yeah. and it's shot yeah. in the exact same way that Yutu Mama Tambien is shot. Exactly. Just like a little, That's like, right. a, mm-hmm. it's almost like a fun little yeah. reference. And it's like, I love that so much, and it feels so cool. But he does make those Hollywood edits, and I think it's in the editing mm-hmm. where it kind of becomes more like a, uh, a typical like Hollywood movie where it's like, oh, this shot. I, I think there were long takes, but then the, you break them up with like, and here's a close up of the, the character's reaction, and uh, that was sort of denied to you in Itu Mama Tambien. So he's getting more back, yeah. and I think it's, and he is working with the same editor, so it feels like it's it's not like it was taken out of his hands or something. It feels like it was just uh, you know, different way of doing it. Do you guys think he had any say over the cinematographer at all? Because obviously he'd only worked with Lubezki up to this point, and the cinematographer of this movie, I don't believe, did any other Harry Potter movies either. I'm sure he did, because Lubezki did not not sign on because it was a Harry Potter movie. He didn't sign on because he had scheduling conflicts, you know? So I'm sure that it was still, like, a... Uh... I'm sure that he had some say in it, if not a complete choice, you know? Because I cool. love some of the camera movement in Little Princess. It's excellent. You know, like mm-hmm. I can s- totally see Lubezki behind the, uh, the camera in this one too, but I figure with a big budget production where there's so many other people with their hands in the pot, so to speak, uh, I'm sure, you know, there were other factors at play there, but I wasn't totally clear on that decision. Yeah. It looks oh. good. There is one major visual issue I have with this movie, and that is the egregious computer-generated uh, Thank imagery. you. Thank you. The one thing uh, Willow, the hippogriff, it's, you know, it's... Well, uh, yeah. They're, I like the hippogriff. The hippogriff, I think, is, like, <sighs> good. Wampy Willow is good. The, like, were chihuahua at the end, uh, I think, is kind of ugly. The uh, werewolf is They the were just looking. trying to go for but, a totally yeah, I mean, different-looking like, werewolf. Like, you know, they were trying I, to be I like, appreciate this is our that, but werewolf. The, I appreciate that, but it's, like... It's w- just the without a practical it, Without like, a practical effect, um, it doesn't really... It can't register as, like, but as I mean, we like talked about the little princess, like, you know, he's, this is his first serious, like, dive into CGI. Obviously, gravity is coming up soon, and that's, like, all CGI. But, uh, but this one, like, he's fucking diving right in. And before this, he's just got that weird fucking monster and little princess, really, that's CGI. And that is kind of egregious in a beautiful way. Like, we've talked about it. Like, it's aged into a kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, cute or something like that? Like, fun? Because it's so bad looking in a weird yeah. way. But it's Quaint. like... But it's also it's dreamlike, uh, too. Yeah. So you kind of write that off as, like, this is the imaginings of a child, and maybe that's but, part of it. But this is yeah. if Harry you, Potter. It's on screen. But this one, if you this dream in gonna... Turbo Graphic 16 uh, <laughs> images, <laughs> then yes. Well, before we go too far down that road, I want to say the things that I do love about this movie because I'm kind of anti-franchise movies in general. I mean, I love, obviously, certain franchises, but, like, Morbius. it's become such... <laughs> it's Morbius. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen it. Maybe it's the best movie you've ever seen. Wait, you said we had to watch Morbius for this week. Are we not tying that <laughs> no, in? No, that was just for your own cultural... Oh, okay, thank good. you. No, I, I don't know. I just mean that, like, once this is happening, we've got this sort of fan-driven movie-making that's really taken over. 
And, uh, you know, even when the first one and the second one came out, it was like they were competing with Lord of the Rings. But, like, those were the two big guys. And then, you know, they were just sort of these weird monoliths that were fighting against each other in a weird way. And now we've got, like, once we get into this, we're getting closer to the Twilight era and the Hunger Games and all that thing where it's just like the movie makers are making it for the fans. They don't really, they know that they're going to make $800 million just because of the name of the thing. You know, it's IP filmmaking, whatever. So, like, it's it's not my favorite era of filmmaking that no. we're in and that this movie is really kicking off or this this series of movies. And, uh, but that being said, this franchise in general and specifically this movie, which is the best of this franchise, like, undoubtedly, is a fun fucking franchise. And, like, I love every movie in it. Greta loves every movie in it. So I do like this movie. And what I love about this one specifically, besides just the, like, fact that it's darker and more... Because it's not darker than the later movies. It's it's just a darker one, one than the previous two. But it's the casting. I mean, Gary Oldman and Timothy Spall and Julie Christie. David and Thewlis. fucking Michael Gambon and David Thewlis, who fucking steals this movie somehow from all those actors. Like, well, Gary Oldman does. But all these... And Emma Thompson. Like, he brings in this already stacked cast that this franchise had. And he brings in these fucking dames and sirs <laughs> you know what i mean that are like the height of like and they all give it their best like none of them are phoning it in i mean gary oldman before this you know he was a great actor and i loved him and that was what excited me about this movie i couldn't have really cared about the first two movies when they came out and then i saw that image of him laughing on the newspaper in the wanted poster rather and i'm like holy shit, Gary Oldman's in this movie and he looks like a fucking psychopath? Like, I'm excited about this movie. And then Quaron's directing it. Like, I was on board. And that's what I love about this one is that, like, Gary Oldman wasn't at the peak of his fame when this movie came out. He was actually kind of at a nadir. But then this movie comes out and, like, he just solidified himself as, like, one of the great actors you know and it's a fucking third movie in a franchise like people don't usually do that when they come on to these things usually you get like kate winslet in uh divergent series who just comes in to like do her little thing you know what i mean i don't know what do you guys like don't you think the acting in this movie is great yes oh fuck off <laughs> no. it's great it is <laughs> no but it, it does Absolutely. introduce as someone who recently watched you know the the last couple which they literally throw every character they've ever brought in into it, it i f didn't realize and i kind of forgot how many of those kind of you know epic characters were introduced in this movie and they I don't, they all do feel right you know they all feel like their own character. I love Emma Thompson. She's kind of quirky in her own weird way. She doesn't have a, too many roles like that. Cause I've just been used to watching her in like the, you know, more formal British movies and things like that. So it's kind of fun watching her kind of like ham it up a little bit. Do this is great. I mean, you know, he does his thing. Yeah. I, I mean, Gary Oldman, I wish he was in it a little bit more, but the parts he is in, he's, you know, he's solid. I guess he hadn't got a lot of work prior to this movie. And then, uh, you know, he took it on. Obviously a lot of the actors, when they take these sorts of roles on are often, uh, one, because, you know, they have kids or other people that would really love yeah. to see them do that. And I guess he was like just catapulted into the next level with his kids and his like nephews and, and nieces and whatnot when he took this role on. Um, yeah, I mean, the acting's solid in this one. I just uh, it's just fun. <laughs> it's like I still keep thinking of Ron Weasley and his little Ron Weasley face who does the concerned look, that, mm, you know, and I'm kind of glad they kind of like went away from. <laughs> <laughs> from like what? the concerned no. Ron face later, no, but he's still that there. A, that was a that was a bad turn in the movie series. There's like a this is like literally the perfect balance between in my mind the early movies, which were just like we're in the it's all, almost more like you're like riding like a, a car on rails like through an amusement park, and you're like oh there's that scene from the book, there's that scene from the book, and like they're just there, and there's no kind of like cinematic pacing, and the acting they're like there are good actors, but they're not. Like, you know, like, it doesn't feel like the performances are, like, fully hitting. But I think they work because the kids are able to, like, the kids feel like they're in that magical situation. And, like, uh, the three main kids, especially Ron in those first two, are so cute. And I love Ron's little 
<laughs> concerned face. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you cut on that because we uh, we used to like refer to that me and my brother the Ron face and like we would. My brother has like long red hair and he would do the face and like it was very totally. uh, it was very I can cute. See that. Uh, I can see that. But but then in the later movies when they try to get more dramatic like the kids. I feel like the the three main kids kind of develop uh, as actors at kind of different speeds. And because they're cutting so many kind of side plots and so many like um, things from the books, but then they're keeping the parts that they do put in fully intact. You get some really kind of jarring kind of like uh, mm-hmm. things between um, the scenes. I'm not really talking about <laughs> Alfonso Cuaron right now. I'm talking about like the Harry Potter series, but I, yeah. I do think this one, th- you know, Things are getting serious, but they're not trying to force the kids to do like melodrama. Serious so it's like, black. so I, I think it, it feels more like a uh, like a movie, and they really speed things up in this one. And things uh, are getting serious could have been the tagline of this movie if if it was like from the nineties and As, like no, uh, produced like by like S-I- Joel Silver. S I U R U. Right. No, that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, exactly. We we um, get it. You. <laughs> I'm funny. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll also um, say I also love the um, you know the mi- well I love two things about this you were saying it, it's like dark compared to the first two the color palette is definitely different it's colder than the first two it also is something that I like to call like I think this movie exists within like an umbrella I w- will call Halloweeniana which is like you know what I mean it's like I yeah. love like you know like Halloween music, like there's a whole genre of like yeah, monster yeah. mash ripoffs that came out in like the fifties and sixties that I'm like obsessed with. And like, uh, you know, just like spooky stuff, but it's like, doesn't have to actually be spooky. It's just kind of like got skeletons and like ca- cats on it and stuff like that. Pumpkins. And I, I feel like he made a conscious effort because there was always that kind of spooky stuff around the periphery, but to mm-hmm. kind of put it in the foreground and make this movie like, like with the choral chorus singing with the giant toads and stuff yeah. and with like the pumpkin patch outside Hagrid's hut, it right. feels like, you know, in the werewolf Definitely. and stuff like that. He's like, let's make it a spooky kids movie. And, and you know, the first two feel much more Christmassy. They which do. Is like a completely yeah. different vibe. Yeah. yeah. That's and Chris yeah, Columbus I mean, for sure. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Obviously. The master. A, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For that, for sure. Um, also with that, um, he did add the, the idea of the singing that was a cordon thing you know and the chorale or whatever uh chris was mentioning like he thought that it was out of place uh you texted us that you know that you thought that like it's kind of weird to have them singing like this double double toil and trouble Macbeth sequence you know and uh i don't know why did why did you feel like that? well I no like i, I get it because it's this, obviously like, they're wizards you know what i mean and the witches and obviously yeah. the witches and Macbeth go the double double toil and trouble you know uh cauldron bubble and you know by the pricking something of my thumbs something comes, wicked yeah. but it's just kind of a creepy thing to start your school year <laughs> off with something wicked this way comes all right children welcome to the school year <laughs> you know like, it's what? What? That's what Travis <laughs> is like it's leaning into the creepiness of like the witch yeah it's like the Halloween no of course like, it, it's, but it's a good point you know what i mean like to, 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 to uh, travis's point it's like this kind of halloweeny vibe like it's gonna get darker obviously the dementors lead this you know every time they come in it's ice everything kind of ice is over it's colder the whole the, it's the first time you see rain in a harry potter movie when they're in the quidditch match you know like you don't see any of that elemental oh. sort of stuff um prior to this movie so they do introduce a whole like, vibe and that definitely you know that song kind of kicks off that vibe i suppose it just kind of feels like objectively like a creepy thing to start off a school year with but you know in the course of the yes. movie it makes sense and speaking of the rain and speaking of the color palette of this movie um, I talked about the like black and white kind of sequence towards the end, but um, this movie really its most beautiful color that it uses is gray. And there are some incredible looking uh, gray shots. Uh, and I feel like Alfonso Cuaron coming from Mexico to England and having such an incredible eye like that is what he's going to pick up on. And, and, and there's yeah. shots there's I mean, the shot of the um, what's it called hippogriff like uh, with its foot in the water where like there's like a misty gray mountains in the background and then this silvery gray light uh, with the sun shining through the clouds. It's one of the most beautiful shots in the movie, completely gray. And then um, one of the most beautiful shots where the train is kind of driving through the rain, like on that giant bridge before it stops and gets uh, uh, attacked by, you know, demon reapers. Uh, So beautiful. Mm hmm. 
Speaking yeah. of those demon reapers uh, in Quar, when I was reading about how because he has such a strong accent that when he was describing the idea of when the uh, Dementors approach or enter the scene, they turn things turn to ice, including the rain. So he's like, yeah, when the rain falls, it turns to ice. Is what he said. And I think the people responsible for the creative the storyboarding, if you will, thought he said eyes. So they made like instead of ice falling, they had like eyeballs <laughs> falling from the sky. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I said ice. <laughs> Not, <laughs> but that, sounds, I, but that might that be like cool. Yeah, I don't I want to see that. Like maybe like I part wanna, of a scene, you know, with the I eyeballs. I want to see those storyboards at least. It sounds like a yeah. Salvador Dali. Right? <laughs> he took this movie. Like, not, he uh, didn't want to necessarily join this movie. I mean, everybody kind of probably has heard this story that's listening to this, whatever, but like Guillermo del Toro, like, berated him and swore at him and like gave him this long talk about how he'd be a fucking idiot if he didn't do it. And then he read the books and was like, oh, I see why you think that like this would be perfect for me. Because it is, I think, like, we've talked about how he's directed a lot of child actors before and you know between E2 Mama Tambien which they're still teenagers obviously and like uh obviously Little Princess and Great Expectations and usually his child acting like is very unique (laughs) like it is unique I should say like it's it's never realist you know I mean besides sorry E2 Mama Tambien definitely is but like the acting is always like weirdly stilted in the other ones anyway it made sense to me also, but also to him that like to direct like these kids in the way that he did. I mean, the kids' performances, you know, you have a may have a problem with Ron's face, but like uh, <laughs> just his hair, just like, his right to hair. Me, <laughs> to me, like they aren't never better than they are in this movie. Also, like Correct. they're just like so. Um, I don't know. It's like it feels like what being a kid is like, which is, I think, what Cordon gets. Like, he's really good at understanding that. Even when his kid actors aren't always the best, he gets what it feels like to be a kid. I don't know. I love Harry in this movie, especially. And I was kind of surprised about how, when I was reading Why Cuaron, because if we think about how sexually charged Y Tu Mama Tambien was, you know, I was thinking, yeah. oh, okay, obviously, you know, Chris well, Columbus so or whatever saw a Little yeah. Princess. Like, that must have been the obvious... Like, okay, that's the movie we, this is the guy we want. But uh, I was surprised how many people actually really loved E2 Mama Tambien. Uh, like J.K. Rowling apparently just loves that movie. She's like, yes, he's a great choice for this one. But you think about, because he does know the mind of teenage boys, I suppose. So that kind of manifests yeah. itself in that sense. But uh, Well, he is, it's fucking you know. horny Corleone again. Like, did you read that? <laughs> like, <laughs> he said, there's like a scene when he's directing... Um, Daniel Radcliffe and the way to get him excited was just all just picture Cameron Diaz in a G string. Right. Like he's still horny Coron in this thing. And then like he had a clause in his contract where he wasn't allowed to swear on set because like right. he's just like he's still gonna be him. Like he's still yeah. this, you know, kind of indie savage filmmaker. I I really think he is. I wonder like, how much I mean, money he gave up, like, you know, messing up that clause. Like, you mother kids just <laughs> Damn. Ron, smirk harder, you mother, you know, like, I wonder, I, I wish smirk. I was behind. No, he said, he said it was the most pleasant two years of his life making this movie, and he would have loved to come back and do more of them, he says, except for, like, it's the the nature of franchise movie making at this point is, like, it was every year they had to come out, and it was just impossible for him to do the pre-production, I mean, sorry, post-production on this movie while he would have to be doing pre-production on the next movie. You know, it would just been too much. Well, it's interesting because the director that I think finally fell into the job and, and kind of shepherded it to the its end was a TV guy before this. So David that, Yates. It right, makes, a little, makes, makes a little sense, yeah. Right. Um, and I don't love those later movies, but, but um, they do, you know, they do feel cinematic. It's not like, you know, I don't feel like they sacrifice. Like, you know, it's not like J.J. Abrams oh, yeah. where you're like, this is a TV show on a big screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to say two things. You brought up uh, Guillermo del Toro and, well, no, let me just say this in the reverse order. You brought up uh, capturing what it's like to be a kid. And, you know, when we watched Ito Mama Tambien, Ian, you mentioned how funny it was when, like, they were making, like, fart jokes in the car. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know if I appreciated that humor maybe as much as you did. I feel like Alfonso Cuaron, his movies are funny 
because you're like laughing at the characters, but like I'm, I, I rarely feel like I'm in, enjoying the humor with the characters. I think like, you know, Little Princess is funny again because of like the filmmaking. You know, in the same way like yeah. Steven Spielberg, if you talk to him, doesn't seem like that funny a guy, but like he can put humor in his movies because he know understands like timing and he understands like you know expectation and stuff like that. Um, Alfonso Cuarón, there is a humor to his films, but I can, I don't think I have the same sense of humor as Alfonso Cuarón. And when I watch this movie, I felt kind of similar to Itu Mama Tambien, where I'm like, I feel like that should be a laugh line, but I'm not laughing. <laughs> so that's like, but which, what's, which, what, which line should be a laugh line? Uh, I felt this at various times of watching oh, the yeah, film. Yeah, gotcha. They're like basically no joke to me landed. And uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that. I feel like his idea of a joke, maybe something's lost in translation, but I, I, I and I'm, I'm just saying this because I love Alfonso Cuaron so much, but I also uh, love humor so much. And I love films with like abundant humor and, uh, to me, when a movie has kind of like a humorless, you know, affect to it, it doesn't feel real to me in a way. And these movies do have humor in a sense, but it's not my sense of humor or something. So I feel like there's some there's some little element that's missing there, uh, or it's just like maybe it's just off of, of what my sensibilities are. But I feel that uh, the more realistic he gets, the less the more I'm like, yeah, this guy is not funny. That basically is what I'm trying to say. I don't think he's funny either. I think when I was, I mean, I guess we don't have to relitigate it, but I think what I meant when I was talking about the Itu Mama Tambien thing was just like the sense of their laughing at it made it fun. You know what I mean? Like, it's not a, like I was like, ha ha ha, that's the best joke I've ever heard. It's more just that like, like I've mentioned the jackass thing where it's like, I don't think it's funny to kick somebody in the balls, but when you see two people legitimately having a good time on screen, it's impossible to not think it's fun. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and I agree with you. He's very unfunny in a lot of ways. We talked about it on the solo to, <laughs> to come to Pareja episode. Like, it's just like ashamedly unfunny. In yeah. A lot of places. Yeah. This movie, I don't, I do find this movie not funny at all, but I don't think that it's obviously trying to be funny a lot. I think like where it goes for um, essence of humor yes. is his um, Gary Oldman's performance being so over the top and Draco Malfoy's performance being so like a caricature of a shitty kid. You know, it's like, it's right. this thing where you're like, I don't think anybody, even a diehard fan of Harry Potter is cracking up when uh, Sirius Black goes like, only one will die tonight. But it is like, it makes me like smile, you know sure, what I mean? Because sure. it's got this like uh, Shakespearean sort of thing, you know? Yeah, I, know. I think, I it, no, I, I do think it's stuff. funniest when it's like just being like ridiculous. I, I agree with that. I think it's just, it's having, it's having fun. But I'm just saying, I feel like this is like the one weak spot, I think, of Alfonso Cuaron's filmmaking. Well, look just at his next two that movies uh, of fucking Gravity and Children of Man. I will, which are like, I will look at Roma. <laughs> yes, we will. Which are like, I mean, Roma's actually got probably a pretty good amount of laugh lines in it. But uh, but Children of Man and Gravity are just yeah. like fucking dirges when it comes right, to that right. you know what i mean like um, but they do do that yeah. hilarious thing that a lot of couples do where you shoot ping pong balls between your mouths and uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that always gets a laugh um but the other thing i wanted to say you brought up uh you know alfonso Cuarón's good friend Guillermo del toro and his kind of influence on his thinking and there's a shot in this movie where um harry spoiler alert conjures this kind of like stag this energy stag to like yeah. uh the patronus spell which uh destroys like a dozen uh dementors that are going to suck the soul out of him and Sirius Black and the introduction of that stag with this like kind of like ethereal music and it's walking between these like green mossy trees is almost an exact recreation of the introduction of the deer god from Princess Mononoke, oh, yeah. and uh, Guillermo del Toro ripped off Princess Mononoke like extremely hard in a little movie called Hellboy 2. And uh, <laughs> so I just true. wanted to uh, say, I don't know, that seemed like it was like a direct uh, influence. Well, I didn't there. realize until I was reading about this movie, like that, I mean, I kind of knew, but I didn't actually see it in writing until this, that. Uh, they consult each other about every movie that they're doing and kind of help each other script wise when they're writing the scripts mm -hmm. or just like plot, you know, plotting it out kind of wise. And, you know, That's both awesome. of them 
are so obviously joined in the way that they make movies and the movies that they've made. Um, can we talk for a second about John Williams' score? I think it's his best score of the 2000s. It's the last movie that he, in the Harry Potter franchise, that he scored besides the, you know, previously written stuff that he'd done for them that people used. But uh, It's good. It's very good. <laughs> but you know who does the score on the next one is uh, our friend Patrick Doyle from Little Princess. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. I mean, that's a great score, too. I listened to... The only reason why I picked up on it so much with this watch is because I listened to a podcast called uh, The Art of the Score, where three composers go through sort of the best film scores in cinema history, and um, they'll, like, change keys or, like, literally just change instrumentation to show you what different things can affect a score. And they go through this one, and they were the ones who, like pointed out that uh, this is their favorite John Williams score since, you know, whatever, since probably uh, Phantom Menace or something like that. But, um, like, they point out in that series of that podcast, like, how many moments in this are just incredible musically for, like, an 80-year-old guy to be writing it or however old he was when he did this. Right, I could do it, but I probably couldn't do it when I was, like, 80. (laughs) It's just, like, you know, the scenes on the um, hippogriff when it's, like, crazy i mean I'll, maybe i'll plug in that song that sound right here when i'm editing because it's like it's just just plug in the other podcast like, if that's so interesting to you ian just like plug in and it I, is don't be jealous of a much more popular podcast well, well it's like <laughs> oh there's three great guys talk about it that's not the point of this it's three idiots talking about like movies like let's keep it to that that's um, the point okay so let's talk about a couple of the other so did you like the music, Chris? Wait, like... Chris didn't get to. I honestly, I like the music, but I can't say it's <laughs> odd. Uh, for those who may not know, I do wear hearing aids, so when I hear oh. and experience a movie, I respond as I mentioned in the past to visual cues more than I do audio cues. I like mm. the music, but again, I would be uh, remiss if I said that it stood out to me uh, among the other ones. Unfortunately, it's not a uh, a thing that stands out to me uh, as again someone with my hearing level but it's certainly beautiful and it matches i really love the end by the way the music at the end with the marauders map and the uh and the credits are awesome i just kept watching that whole like ending sequence yeah, so it yeah. just got a big smile on my face when that happened so yeah, yeah. good stuff i do feel like it, yeah you said it like matches and i do feel like it kind of um you know it was it's not it was a beautiful score my wife and i both like commented on it when we were watching it but it it doesn't um you know it's not as maybe showy as some others scores and, and soundtracks of even Alfonso Cuaron's movies. You know what I mean? It didn't like stand out uh, in a way. It really did just kind of like, like an old fashioned score, just really emphasize like, you know, yeah. the emotions of the, the scenes. Um, it, so it was highly effective, but also very beautiful. I could see myself turning it on um, yeah. in those Halloweeny months. <laughs> I am I am glad there weren't too many there were no songs involving lyrics like you know in that horrible you know sequence in in Great Expectations where there's just horribly cheesy songs with words I mean Little Princess was good you know because the I think they were drawing from uh, some poetry or William well, Blake he did though. but there's was there, were there any um, or am I tripping well John Williams composed the Something Wicked this wicked well yeah but that's because the kids are, that's a diegetic song where like the kids but are still, actually singing it was diegetic it. but it was still actually written as part of the score. Like for the movie, we should. Uh, um, somebody it, should. Has well, I'm sure someone's done this, but like John Williams as like a, a musical theater composer is kind of a interesting thing to me. And I always uh, the movie Hook is something that I was obsessed with as a kid, and now it like baffles and disgusts me on a lot a, 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 a lot of levels. <laughs> I feel exactly the same. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I mean, I can see still very clearly what what was so appealing to me, like from the visuals to the performances to the especially the well, music. The and he does a fake he does a fake Peter Pan score, which is uh, with songs, which is not the Peter Pan musical that's like extremely famous. Uh, mm-hmm. And then he also puts just a random like song as if from a musical into the middle of the film, just one single song. Yeah. And I always, I have actually like a, a special like affinity for movies that have one song in them and no others. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. My 
favorite example is uh, Eraserhead, but uh, yeah, yeah. but the you know when you're alone, you're not alone. Yeah. Song is like another one that's like I think is really cool. So anyway, just a little think, aside about John I think Lane. the story behind that was that that movie spent uh, you know the first few years before it actually got made when it was in Steven Spielberg's head um, as a musical, like as a full blown musical, and somehow it like carried through. Just that one song. Yeah. You know? But that's kind of speaks to like the the train wreck of that movie, even though I agree, like I was obsessed with it when I was a kid. Like I loved it. Uh so it does speak to something in like in the same way that Quaron can do, like of like kids get it more than adults sometimes, you know? Um in terms of the kids' movies that Quaron's made. Uh because hmm. kids love this movie. Can I just mention like not just Greta, but also Angela's kids, Layla and Riley, like are both fucking Harry Potter obsessives. And um, I mean, one of the games that they play, like literally driving down the street, list Harry Potter things to uh, to each other until they run out of things kind of thing. Wait, like it's, it's like that You got to plug like... in uh, Christopher Guest <laughs> naming nuts to the star yes. right from uh, Best in Show. Okay. Pistachio yes. nut, walnut. <laughs> Macadamia nut. <laughs> yeah. I say peanut, hazelnut, cashew nut, macadamia nut. That was the one that was sent her <laughs> into a, going crazy. She said, you stop naming nuts. Because it is like, I mean, and I do it with them because like, because I, I mean, they, the joy that this movie brings them, you know, and uh, I don't know. I just think like, I don't know. It is also for kids. That's all I was trying to say. Like, kids love this movie. So I don't know if that's another reason why I don't want to judge it, like, as harshly as necessarily as you guys are kind of judging it. Uh, deal with it. Asshole. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> well, and therein, speaking of being for kids, therein lies the irony for me because I would say, and maybe this is a hot take, that this is like, the least desirable world to ever want to live in. Like the Harry that's Potter funny. universe is the most terrifying, <laughs> yeah, dangerous really world. I'd rather live in Star Wars world, Lord of the Rings world, <laughs> even Hunger Games has a higher chance of probably surviving <laughs> this Hunger world Games. than the Harry Potter world. <laughs> Just look at this school, all right? The nat, the, 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 the school the school sport is involving kids yeah, on broomsticks with dangerous. no security harness flying at a high rate of speed, <laughs> an entire football field above the ground, chasing these things in the rain. There's a giant, like, Hippogriff that could claw your face right <laughs> off, and that's part of your class, you know. That you hop right on this thing. There's a literal giant murderous tree that will attack you unprovoked if you even come close to it, you know. There are these like evil, like uh, <laughs> creepy things floating around the school, like protecting you yet attacking you at the same time. I mean, there's a professor who is literally turns into a uh, a murderous werewolf when the moon is full and who lives on the same grounds as these kids. There's a giant executioner guy with a like huge humongous blade walking around campus like you could just cast a spell on that thing and it'll die you know like there's plenty of things that you could do you don't you need a dude like chopping the like the poor hippogriff's head off like you know it's just yes. a scary place to be and this only this movie there's like plenty of well, <laughs> other movies where it's like there's a giant troll living under the, the school why do you, why is that there you know Oh man, I would never Wait. send my kids to Hogwarts. Let's put it that way. That's like a, that's a, that's a death sentence. I would be surprised if a single school year goes by where there's not one casualty. Like at least one like kid gets off. But isn't it funny though that's that like the movie and the books obviously like it's a refuge. You know, like the the dangerous place for Harry is when he's at home or back back with the Dursleys living in a cabinet under the stairs. But yeah, that's more it's like, it's, that's more miserable when you're like actually having like yeah. adventures. That's like that's like being alive. Right. And this, and, uh, the books especially have that kind of like dry British wit and, and kind of like, you know, with this movie, especially I was reminded of like, you know, movies from our childhoods, like, uh, time bandits and, um, mm -hmm. you know, never ending story where like, you can watch a, a character go like undergo like tragedy and mm -hmm. be like, Oh yeah. shit. And like get legitimately scared. Like Willow's uh, or the baby and Willow's parents getting eaten by hog yeah. wolves. Right. Like, uh, <laughs> like moments where you're actually kind of like where things get really real. And as a kid that that's like, that's very, very powerful. And this movie has, I think the same kind of like respect for kids. No, um, I'm actually, kidding, just going of course, back, but it's there. No, no, that know? was that was very funny, and uh, I don't think you should send your kids to Hogwarts. I think uh, <laughs> I don't care how prestigious it is. Like. Yeah, right? <laughs> 
There is uh, one in the United States, you know, send them over yeah. there. Apparently. I don't know. I don't um, know how many there are in the world. Yeah. I think, well, I think there is a list of those like they, on their website and I think they're all racist. Like they all have super uh, racist names uh, on the Pottermore <laughs> website. They, they always oh, post man. things on, on the Harry Potter website and then they have to like take them down a week later because they're wildly offensive to like, uh, stereotyping like basically every country and like everybody. We should also make like a little aside, like trans rights, trans lives matter to anyone uh, listening yeah, to this. Yeah, like we don't, we can separate the, uh, you know, the author and the, and the art, but, uh, I just want to go on record. What do you mean? I mean, and also I think it's, is totally she anti-trans? If you, if you, she's, ex- she's extremely anti-trans. Yeah. Oh. yeah she's, yeah. she's actually like doubled down on her position about <laughs> like, you know, it's, she's, I mean, JK Rowling, when you said earlier in the week, uh, Chris, you were watching all the Harry Potters and we were texting and you were saying like, I've got one big problem with the Harry Potter franchise or whatever. And I was like, I hope it's JK Rowling. Cause oh, yeah. she is a nightmare. I mean, you know, it, I, I would say just to go back, like I'm also okay. If you can't uh, separate the author from these books, I think a lot of people have had this book or this story poison for them totally and rightfully so like i would totally understand that i also uh you know i don't want to support her anymore like obviously we just did a whole podcast like promoting how much i love her but <laughs> i don't know how much i love her movie but it is like it's it's gross and fucking nasty and she sucks but hmm. What about, but like you said, but you're going to see the crimes of Grindelwald, right? You got to know about what the crimes I of Grindelwald. I haven't seen any of those movies, but uh, I think it's the secrets of Dumbledore or something is the next one. I want to hear um, Owen Wilson talk about the crimes of Grindelwald. I think <laughs> Owen Wilson saying that phrase would be really amusing <laughs> to me. Uh, I just want, yeah, well, I'll also go on record that my set of Harry Potter Blu-rays are bootleg um they all have really badly uh-huh. xeroxed covers and they're a little <laughs> bit the discs are like see-through so um i'm pretty sure jk rowling did not um did not oh, get good. another I mean, penny i don't think i don't think that she's <laughs> hurting for money and ever will be but well uh, you're welcome for that people I mean, <laughs> yeah wait. so thanks for that wait no that's bad um but no i just think that like you know it's it's terrible she's just chris so that you know she basically like has came out and said when the bathroom stuff was happening, like, I don't think that there should be unisex bathrooms because I was, you know, uh, attacked in a bathroom by a man when I was younger and I don't want that to happen. People were like, well, you know, like, that's not, they aren't men (laughs) if they're women using a woman's bathroom. And she's like, well, men are men and women are women. But but she came under this huge hellstorm. And then since then, Basically, every actor of the franchise has had to divorce themselves from her and say something in a statement being like, the only person who didn't, not shockingly, is the fucking human asshole, Gary Oldman. (laughs) But whatever, that guy's a psychopath. But But just to um, point out, like, you know, her thing about uh, the bathroom laws or whatever, like, would not have affected her getting attacked by a man in a bathroom. Of course like, that's, not. So this but, is not obvious. Right, I mean. She's a fucking idiot. Yeah. And like she's got this thing that a lot of rich people have where when something, when everybody has said yes to them for 20 years and then suddenly somebody pushes back, she just assumes that she's still in the right and that people will have her back. And so she just doubles down on it. And her base is like shifting closer to the right, unfortunately, but whatever. I mean, that's, like you said, it's not that I, I would forgive anybody for not ever wanting to talk or think about Harry Potter again because of her. But at the same time, it's easy to, it's not easy, but it's possible to like watch this movie from a Corone lens and not a JK Rowling lens for me, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Well, with that said, can we, I'm sure these conversations are all being had with much more nuance and uh, on Tumblr or something like that. So let's go, let's go back to the movie and yeah, yeah. could we like, what are our final thoughts? Like, what are the kind of Corone themes? Don't, what don't we see? Because I, that. yeah. For me, the number one Quaron theme, which we didn't even talk about for this whole episode, is the relationship between Harry and both David Thewlis and Gary Oldman. Or I should say uh, Sirius Black and Professor Lupin. Because it's the first time... I mean, he's kind of tried to have a, a father figure and a mother figure in Dumbledore and McGonagall, but it's a much more teacher-student relationship. 
this is the first time that he's got like father figures, you know, two of them. And Quaron, if you think back to Little Princess, and we talked about it a lot in that episode, like he really is such a master at like, or just not even, he's just so in love with that relationship between a father and a son or, you know, like that, that dynamic. And I think that like where this movie is the strongest is the affection you feel between Lupin and Harry. And then also the um, fucking sudden affection that you feel for Gary Oldman at the end, even though he wasn't even in the movie for most of it. And then when he is, he's a bad guy. And then you get 10 minutes of him suddenly having these kind eyes. And you're like, oh, finally, Harry gets a dad. Like, finally. And it feels in that moment, like when Sarah gets her dad back in Little Princess to me. Like, it's, it's a really beautiful moment. That's a great point, and it's interesting to think about um, great expectations of all the themes it could have explored. There's so much time, too much time, on his weird relationships with uh, Chris Cooper and, uh, yeah. what's his name, uh, Robert De Niro at the end. And you're yeah. like, where did this come from? But it's just like a, a failed attempt at, 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 again, kind of like exploring that relationship. You know, my feeling with Alfonso Cuaron in his movies is like capturing you know, that he's trying to, like, capture this, like, the social reality of a place and time and um, kind of juxtapose that with, like, the the mythology of a place as well. And then also trying to kind of, um, through, like, a fantasy, almost, like, imagine, like, a better world. And I think Mm -hmm. maybe this one does it on some level, but it's not really kind of... Well, he's so tied to what the books does ex- that he doesn't get to do it. Ex- so, exactly, but, and that is there. I think it. I think it is there a little bit, but it's something you'd have to like kind of suss out in like an essay format or something. Or if I had taken yeah. done any effort to like prepare for this <laughs> recording, no, but maybe I, I, I could have just done it, it. But but that's that's why it's hard to really parse out themes in this movie is because it is like I said earlier, like it's so bound to the fans and like them getting to see what they read in the books on screen. Like they don't, but he doesn't get a lot of leeway to just sort of put himself into it. But I, I think the juxtaposition does happen a little bit though. Like, especially like in those early scenes, like you were saying, Ian, like he really pours his style into those early scenes um, where, you know, when he leaves the house again of the, uh, the aunt and uncle, the Dursleys and, um, it's again the handheld camera as he's dragging the suitcase out and you're on the streets and it's nighttime and the light, the raking like street light over the, like the wet streets. And it feels for the first time in any of these movies, like you're in a real place. And, and uh, which is like kind of exciting if you'd watched the first two leading up to this, yeah. which I kind of did in preparation for this. Um, you're like, oh, it's like the real world. And Harry's like a real kid and he's carrying something with weight. And uh, it doesn't seem like he's going to just go into like a magical porthole right away. It's like he's got to find his way there. And then kind of like when he goes to Diagon Alley, it feels more like a, or wherever wherever he goes. I don't know if he goes to Diagon Alley. He goes somewhere magical. And it feels more like a Terry Gilliam world where he's kind of mashing up kind of like real London with kind of magical stuff on top of it rather than like he just takes a right and then he's like at a Dickens fair. Which is how the first two al- movies felt. I, absolutely. And I also think that, like, sorry, Chris, I'll let you get to your, your thoughts on that. But I think that uh, he also did that with Hogwarts itself. Like, in the first yes. two movies, Hogwarts is, you know, this sort of unexplainable, just like you said. Like, you're walking into one room, it's one thing. You walk into another room, there's no... Um, map basically (laughs) that you could like it doesn't feel physically real in any way and then in this movie he really just did such an incredible job of like making it a set you know even if it's not all a set it feels like a very um real location you know like you understand the layout of the castle in a way more or of the whole grounds in a whole in a in a very real authentic way like and i think that that was really important to him and he's obviously so I mean, the way he films the sets and even Great Expectations, which is like his worst movie, is incredible. Like he's, it's it's important to him, like filming the locations. And I'll just say, like, there, I felt like there was a little more, f- like the the TV set again in that first scene, like at the dinner table, that the kid even like can't pull himself away from, even as his like family friend or relative or something is like being like blown up like a balloon and floating away. Like that felt like it could be like a children of men moment, right? Like just like this weird, like uh, entertainment thing, like happening, like at the dinner table, like um, the way it's filmed. I don't know. Just wanted to throw that in there. And Chris, 
you have, we haven't even talked about like one of the coolest things that this movie does, which is the time travel stuff and the way that's structured. <laughs> and you see yeah. the story twice from two different perspectives and it's so much fun and so yeah. cool. Yeah. And like, uh, Chris, you, you, as a lover of uh, time travel movies, what, what do you think? I love it. And I also like, I, I don't like thinking too much about time travel either. Just kind of go with it. You know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. yeah. I, I do love it. I, as soon as I saw this movie, I'm like, yes, finally time travel. This is an amazing <laughs> thing. And then of course it's an, ama- <laughs> uh, and then of course they literally never draw on this incredibly powerful resource ever again for the rest <laughs> no. of the series really funny, <laughs> but no i, I loved it and i like the reveal the that like hermione was actually the... attending all these different classes at the same time because she's literally like there's two hermione's kind of in a way you know mm-hmm. occurring uh yeah i really love that part um i'm a big time travel fan so you know just watch chrono crimenos speaking of uh spanish language time travel uh related yeah. movies uh super fun i also was going to say that no film of Alfonso Cuaron's filmography better encapsulates his anti-authoritarian, anti-surveillance state stance than Harry Potter 3. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, there are elements to it too, but if you think about it, no, literally, totally. like there's, you're, ev- you're always being watched. The Marauder's Map will literally show anyone you want to at all times. You're always being potentially surveilled. You can literally wear an invisibility cloak and stand right next to someone as they're talking about you. You know, your very pet could be an evil, murderous thug who's lived with you your their entire life or whatever you know uh, i'm kind of kidding when i say that obviously i mean t- children of men is but more I mean, of like an authoritarian examples, state but uh but it's no, still a concern you, you know kidding, but but the examples that you didn't give are very real i mean it's the movie where the dementors come and are patrolling the grounds and suddenly the students aren't in this magical world like they were in the first two and they're suddenly like you know in a sort of weird like like you said, authoritarian state. Like it's yeah. the first movie that really introduces that. You're right. There is like a a, a line between this and, and Children of Men. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. And you know, before we watch the next movie, uh, I really want you guys to also check out the little short film he did for Parisia Tem. And I think we've all seen it before, but I think it is really interesting as like kind of uh more than than the shorts are for like maybe some of the other directors in that in that uh anthology. I really feel like it was like an important piece for him to to do and work out. And if if memory serves me, it's basically one shot with no and and the camera is not moving like it would to kind of like do dramatic like uh kind of like reveals of emotion or kind of close ups or anything like that. It's totally at a distance. It's it's um a direct kind of linked between like the work he's done up to this point and then everything that follows, especially Roma though. And, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so I'd love for you guys to watch that and we can talk about it a tiny bit next time. we Will do. It's late to talk about this, but I just wanted to mention it because, uh, you know, it'll kind of informs the rest of the movies going forward too, is that coming off of you two mama Tambien, which if you guys listening to this episode of this podcast, cause it's Harry Potter, like go back and listen to that episode because it, we talk about how incredible, of, incredible of a movie it is. Like, I love that movie so much. And it's so different in terms of like the scope of what it's trying to do than everything he does after, after it, you know, um, he really is like, it's, it makes sense that he would go to a bigger budget movie because that movie was such a guarantor of, you know, whatever he could do. Basically he like made it for a pretty low budget and it was a big hit as an indie movie. So he gets this sort of free pass to do whatever movie he wants to do next and they were begging him to do this movie. You know, he didn't want to do it, but he took it on. And obviously this is like a $800 million franchise movie. Like, and then from this, he goes on to another big fucking movie. Like he doesn't, I don't know. It's weird that he, that he never really feels, I mean, I guess Roma. Kind Ian, of you know, he does children of men after this, right? That's a big movie. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess it's not as big as gravity, but like, it's a fucking big movie. Like it's, it's big in, I mean, it wasn't necessarily as big of a hit necessarily, but it was not a hit. It's yeah. But it is like, I think that like in a different world, it could have been just as big of a hit, you know, I just mean that like, it wasn't, it was filmed to be to me like a fucking big blockbuster. I don't know. It's not, 
I don't know. Well, speaking of, you've remember. you've said the number eight hundred million a couple times now, and I think it's funny. I read something about how this is the only Harry Potter movie not to gross over eight hundred million worldwide. I'm not sure if that oh, still really? holds true. Oh, I, weird. I know, I know. I just read that, but it's funny you said literally eight hundred million a couple times, and this is the the only one not to do well, so. Well, I just went and saw this movie in the theater uh, a week or two ago because it's it's playing in the theater again. So. You know, I guess... Uh, the Sebastiani, made, or is it just... It's a... probably made... No, is that like a, you know, whatever you call it, like a Cinema West theater, whatever. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, it's probably made it back by now, made over 800 million by now. But that is weird. So that means it's the least financially uh, profitable movie for them? That's insane. Since it's well, I don't know about though. profitable, just in terms of its gross, though. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Good point. Yeah. Well, what do you think, guys? Should we uh, rank them at this point? I think it's probably relatively... Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys had that lined up yet, but no, uh, but I can, yeah, I can f- come I can up with it. Easy. What's yeah. up? I'll do it. Do it. I mean, I'm sticking with E2 Mama Tambien, A Little Princess, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, Great Solo Conto Perea, Great Expectations. That's exactly my order. You uh, copied me in. Are you looking at my notes? <laughs> <laughs> Rude, Ian, uncalled for. Um, yeah, switch Little Princess and Itu Mama Tambien or tie them, but uh, that's basically my list too. Um, I can't believe we're over halfway done, you guys. This is yeah. Wow, that's flying, right. We're flying by, yeah. Certainly not the eighteen movie filmography of the Coens. It's a little bit, a <laughs> yeah. little bit longer. No, it's kind of nice. Yeah. Was, I mean, I wish <laughs> that I could spend. I wish I could spend a little more time with Corrupt. Like, I feel like, you know. He doesn't make enough movies. I know. When's his next way? movie coming out? We have to watch his Bring weird, it. you know, educational films on autism or whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah. Also, we, we stand <laughs> with autistic rights as well, and we disavow any uh, statements or yeah. films made by Quaron on the subject. Uh, yeah. Just throwing that in there, too. We got a lot of apologizing to do. This might be the series that gets us canceled, and uh, <laughs> we, de- we deserve it, frankly. <laughs> That's how you know when you made it, when people actually care enough to cancel you. you know? Exactly. Except for then, we'll, then we'll start getting sponsors to, for the podcast after, after, after we get canceled. Stamp, then we'll start getting just to put a timestamp on this, last night was the Grammys and Louis C.K. won Best Comedy Album, so <laughs> cancel doesn't exist. Deserved. No, just kidding. I'm just joking. Um, all right, guys. Uh, all right. Mr. Vantage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew you were going to do that. I knew you were going to uh, do that. All right, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Take care. Thank you for listening to Autour Detour. We'll see you again next week.